Okay. Well, good afternoon. I guess it's not good morning anymore because it's not. Uh, you know, it's afternoon. Um, so, as Jenny said, I'm I'm Emily. Um, I teach at UNF, so I haven't had the pleasure of teaching any of you because you're all impressive, you know, upperclassmen and grad students. So, um, just just a few quick notes before we get started. I noticed this uh, this past weekend. I read at Jacks by Jacks, and I, I was listening to my uh, colleague read after I finished and. You know, people are really like visual in their appreciation of poetry. So they'll, you know, you'll read a poem and they'll really like it, and they're like nodding and smiling at you. And I was like, man, I don't have any way to guess what people are thinking when I read my work. So I am going to read a few poems for you today. So if you like it, please give me some sort of auditory, you know, <clears throat> feedback. Like rattle the drink in your glass or tap on the table. I don't care. Um, if you hate it. <laughs> I guess keep that to yourself. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> you can be silent as long as you want. Um, but again, it, it is funny for me. I was sitting up there and I thought, man, I have no idea how they feel about my work. So um, if you like it, if you dig it, please give me some sort of feedback. Um, I will also say that if you would like to read more, I have uh, media cards with all of my links on them. So if you want one, we can pass one down to you. Um, there is a QR code on the back that takes you right to my blog. So. Uh, all my social media and stuff is linked on there. So feel free to snag one or shout out that you would like one, and we'll send one down to you. Let's just pass them around. Let's oh, sure, see. absolutely, yeah. And I've got a ton more, so if you run nice. out. So um, I picked out a few poems I wanted to read today, and they specifically address the idea of disability. Uh, not all of my poetry does overtly address the idea of disability or blindness. Um, what I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, I, I thought about all of the decisions I make as a writer about disclosure and the idea that you write a poem and you send it off to somebody and your worst fear as a blind writer is you send your poem to some really cool magazine that is not overtly about disability, you know, some, just some really cool magazine. And they open it up and they read your bio or maybe they don't, you know, sometimes they don't read your cover letter. And then they open your poem and they read it and it's a blindness poem. And they go, ooh, what am I supposed to do with this, right? Because the average person who meets me on the street generally has their reaction. Um, now that I have a dog, people are a lot nicer to me because the dog is really cute. But most of the time, when it's an issue of disability, people get really uncomfortable. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. And so as a writer, um, one of the insecurities that I deal with all the time is, how do I help people through that discomfort without erasing who I really am? And Sometimes it's things that I think of on my own, but other times it's conversations that I have with colleagues. So the first poem I'm going to read for you is a response to something that a colleague once told me. Um, this colleague was having a lot of trouble writing a blind character. And I guess this person thought that I would be like the go-to, you know, like, hey, how do I write a character like you? Um, and I, in my head, I'm going, well, how would that be any different, right? Uh, is this character going to eat like blind cereal? You know, are they going to go to their blind job? Are they going to put on their blind coat? Um, you know, dial their blind phone. Um, no, right? This character is going to have the same thoughts and feelings and emotions um, that any other character would have. And, and maybe like negotiating certain parts of their life would be challenging, right? Like, oh, okay, well, how, you know, maybe that person wanted to ask me, well, how does this work if the character has a guide dog? But that's not really what they were asking me. The con conversation was like, I'm just having such a hard time imagining how this character would fall in love. You know, like really basic stuff that you think pretty much any character would, would, with the same kind of level of mental competence would be able to achieve. And so I got really annoyed. And as usually happens when I get really annoyed, I wrote a poem about it. <laughs> and this poem really came out, and I, I honestly haven't done much editing on it. It, um, it pretty much came out as is, which is un unusual for me. So it's called A Phenomenology of Blindness. Um, and a phenomenology is just kind of a coming to understand something through experiences. That's how I understand it. So that's why this is called A Phenomenology of Blindness. Okay, A Phenomenology of Blindness. It's not like walking through life with your glasses off. I mean, sometimes we wear glasses, but they're different from yours. Thicker, broader, darker, and they don't work the quotidian miracle of correctable vision. It's not like getting your eyes dilated once a year, staggering out to the car under those stiff black shades with the sharp edges, tearing up beneath the merciless sun and wondering how you'll manage the drive home. Damn, someone just texted you and you can't read your phone. It's not like groping in the dark when you come home late because you can't find your keys. You and your girlfriends had too many pomegranate martinis. <clears throat> but 
I know it was a birthday, but if you could think clearly, you'd know where your keys are. It's not like leaving the nail salon after a pedicure, shuffling forward in those disposable flip-flops, doing everything you can not to chip that gorgeous raspberry shimmer polish. It's not like that at all. It's not like feeling faint because you forgot to eat lunch. You were working so hard you couldn't even stop for a granola bar. So you hold on to your colleague's arm as he guides you outside. It's nice to have support, you think. Nice to know he doesn't mind helping. It's not convenient, popular, or cumbersome. It's not a filter that you can slide over the world. Not a stylish coat hanging in your closet. I too am waiting for winter because I love wearing my coats. Pea coats, swing coats, blazers. I have so many. It's just that blindness isn't one of them. Thank you. <laughs> so when I was writing that and I um, was thinking about it, uh, I, I thought, man, there's really no good way to say what, what is blindness, right? What is it? Because everybody feels it and experiences it differently. I, I have some vision. Um, I wear glasses, but I'm not someone who's like, you know, totally blind, doesn't have any vision, but at the same time I still call myself a blind person and a blind poet, because if I, if I use the word blind, uh, people stop trying to relate to me visually. If I say, hey, I've got low vision, then people go, oh, how much vision do you have? Hmm. And then they're like, you know, um, holding things out to me and not telling me where they are, or like, you know, hey, I brought you a drink, and it's somewhere on the table and I don't know where it is. Uh, so I, I use the word blind because it works better for me. Um, and that's really, I mean, why else does anybody use language, right? I, we like to use language because it's, we say that it's, th that's the label that applies, but I mean, really it's the label that applies and it does what you want it to do. So um, I think sometimes when I write poetry, people probably say, well, how does she know that that's blue? Or, you know, how does she know that that's red? And I've just kind of tried to get over proving myself to other people, I guess, in my poetry. Um, but I do sometimes use poetry to highlight moments that I think are, are pretty funny uh, that happen in the life of a blind person. So let me see if I can get to that one. But you know, in writing the first one that I just read for you, um, it occurred to me that I couldn't define it by what it is. I had to define it by what it wasn't. Because how can I write about a blindness that, you know, uh, everybody feels? I don't know that there's a way to say what is, what is blindness with a capital B. Um, but I can tell you what it's not, <laughs> and it's not feeling like you're groping in the dark, you know, like all these things that people think that it is, right? It's not shuffling forward, not knowing how to walk around. Um, I did have a woman once say, well, you've got to have some vision. And I said, well, how do you know? And she said, well, you walk so confidently. I thought, okay, um, <laughs> that's weird, because I mean, why would it, you know, um, a confident blind, I know if someone doesn't travel well, that's different than someone being a blind person. You know, a lot of times when you see a blind person shuffling around, maybe they're a new blind person and they just haven't learned how to travel well. So it is really weird to see what people think when they reveal these things to you. So this next one is called Inside Jokes. And um, it sprung out of a panel that I was on. And again, um, this was amusing to me. So the, the whole uh, workshop, it was a whole convention, um, a state convention for the Florida Council of the Blind. So this hotel had um, several ballrooms filled with blind people. I mean, I don't know if they knew what to do with themselves because there was people tapping canes and walking with dogs and, um, and you know, uh, and, you know, vendors selling blindness products and all this stuff. And, and so my panel was on disability and employment. And so um, I got in and I, and I kind of felt out the situation and then some things made me laugh. And so I decided to write about it. And I'm, I'm curious if the things that I'm laughing at will be the things that you'll be laughing at. So we'll see. And if not, <laughs> the inside jokes might make you laugh. So this one's called Inside Jokes. Inside jokes, a long draped table hosts five blind guests, two, moderator, um, two microphones, one moderator, a last supper strewn with free pencils, insufficient paper, and clear water glasses. In reaching for the only microphone that still works, my partner threatens to send his decorous goblet tinkling to the floor. It's thousand shards, a dark promise for the paws of our assembled guide dogs. A second swipe for the mic brings the glass an inch from peril, so he hands it to me. I place it out of reach before the empty chair at my right. No one mentioned the glasses when we sat down. No one filled the water jug. No one brought an extra microphone 
So we pass the good one back and forth, rustling the heavy mic stand along the disposable tablecloth, clinking the cord against the overturned water glasses, bracing ourselves for the feedback. <laughs> Thank you. So I hear some giggles. What strikes you as funny about that? The feedback pun. Right? Yeah, I was pretty proud of that. Like, score! You know? yeah. like, it doesn't awkward. seem contrived. <laughs> I can totally do that. I would say it's just the awkward situation. Yeah, okay. Um, I've always joked about uh, with my family, like if you ever go to a nice restaurant, you have these clear water glasses on a white tablecloth. It's just a nightmare if you have any kind of vision, right? Because they're, they're pretty much invisible. Um, but the funny thing to me is, again, we've got a whole panel of blind people talking to a room full of blind people, and nobody thought to say, hey, guys, FYI, there's water glasses all along your table. And some of them are full, and some of them are empty. And um, then we've got this microphone that doesn't work, and so we're literally picking up the mic stand and moving it across the table, clank, 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 like with the cord. I mean, it was just this nightmare. It was so funny. Um, I mean, it was a hilarious moment, and, and there was at that point, uh, and th this didn't make it into the poem, but there was a panelist I didn't like, and my goal in life was to keep the microphone away from her, so I would deliberately, <laughs> like, you know, I'd reach over, like, and another thing, and I'd pull it back over to my side. <laughs> you know, I was like, you got to take it where you can. Um, so, But it was funny to me because it was like this situation where if you thought about it, um, as a blind person, that was nerve-wracking, you know, like... Um, I'm gonna knock something over. These goblets are gonna fall, and then you know our dogs are all under the table. Like, uh, mm -hmm. so it's it's funny to think about a, a moment like that. And so I like to think that when I put a poem like that out there, um, I get to show somebody something about disability that they would not have thought of, and it's not some cliched saccharine portrayal of you know someone feeling inspired or someone making it against all the odds or someone being cured. I mean, the, the awkwardness is what's fun about that poem. Um, the fact that we're laughing at the situation going, really, this is a nightmare. <laughs> it's a train wreck. So um, I think I'll read one more for you. But I always wonder, uh, as a writer, when I send poems like this out into the world, I mean, there's the chance that an editor is not going to get what I'm doing. Um, there are many publications that I've, I've sent work to that are specifically related to disability, and so they're looking for, not necessarily poetry like that, like I'm a, you know, paragon, and they're looking for my work, um, but they're looking for poetry that addresses disability concerns, uh, but, but a lot of other journals aren't, you know, um, and, and maybe the only things that they know to look for are what they've seen on Lifetime, you know. Um, either disability as a tragedy or disability as something to be cured or overcome. And so there's the chance that they might read something of mine and go, oh, cool. Or the chance that they might read it and go, I don't get that. I don't, you know, let's not mess with that. It's not the idea about disability that we're familiar with. So I'm hoping for the first one, you know, I'm hoping that people will read it and then it'll kind of shift their focus a little bit. I, I'm not, you know, hoping that they'll go complete 180, but that it will just be that little nudge that takes them somewhere slightly different. Um, and, so, and so some of my poetry addresses disability overtly in that sense, and other poems just kind of, I'm not intentionally bringing disability in, because there's really not a way to say, well, I'm, this is a poem about disability, but this one isn't. Um, because when you're a disabled poet, I think they're all about disability, but then they're all not about disability. So I mean, where, you know, I, I guess a question I'll say I have for you after I read this next one is, you know, where, where do your identity politics come in when you're writing when you're creating. So um, this one is called uh, Deficiencies, and it's a tribute to my little friend here who is down here by my feet. Probably cannot be seen on camera, my um, guide dog. So this was again at a disability event, um, but it's not really about people. So Deficiencies. Under the table, my guide dog lies nose to nose with a reddish golden retriever named Conrad. Their prone bodies poised in a fragile silence that spotlights the rhythm of swaying tails. Thwack, thwack against my shoe. I reach down to find muzzles pressed close, heads unflinching at my touch. Two dogs totally absorbed in each other, completely beyond me. I wrestle the sudden urge to tumble my untailed body from this stiff chair, to lay myself out and measure my worth against their intimacy. Hesitation is comforting. Delay is denial. The truth, I'm only one kind of companion. Oh. <laughs>
it's no lie, when I read um, this weekend at Jacks by Jacks, everyone was like, I love the dog poems, they're the best. Everybody <laughs> loves the dog poems. So I think that's my way in. Maybe that's my way into mainstream culture. <laughs> poems about dogs. Um, everybody loves dog stuff. So um, again, when I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, I, you know, my title is Creative Activism, which sounds very you know, academic. But I like to think that the the kind of, maybe the protest that I'm, I'm doing and the work that I'm doing is not, maybe it's militant and maybe it's not, um, maybe it's aggressive and maybe it's not, but it's just a way of, of putting a story out there that doesn't get out there. And so um, I, I kind of like to resist the, the pressure of disclosure, like that somebody is owed all of these explanations about who I am and what I can do and what my blindness means. I like to resist that. Um, I used to feel really pressured to tell people all those things and then and then I realized that it's really not okay for people to ask me all of those details um, and so and it's also really annoying by the way to get a poem that explains things to you like a teaching poem you know <laughs> um, a poem that's that's telling you how to feel so and I and I also you know as a writer I thought I don't want to be the kind of writer that has to annotate my own work like I have to tell you and this illusion came from this old poet from a hundred years ago and things like that I want people to be able to get it so when I when I think about my writing that way, there's just not a, a place for me to explain all this stuff. It's like I've got to kind of create a mood that people can step into or um, a sensation that they can go, oh, it's not like that. Okay, I get it, you know. But um, I think that so often when you're publicly a disabled person, uh, there is a pressure to explain what it's all about and, and to be kind of the museum curator for people. Um, I used to tell people all the time, you know, the Blindness Museum is closed, mm -hmm. <laughs> closed on weekends, you know. <laughs> um, but, but there's that pressure to explain and so I like to think that poetry, because it's not, it, it does, it's not explanation in the way that we think of, you know, logical explanation. Um, I like to think that it pushes back against that just by its form alone. You know, is there something that the form can tell you that, uh, you know, a, a prose explanation can't? So I feel like I've been talking a lot. I'd like to hear from you. Any thoughts or questions for Emily? I have a question about uh, disclosure. Sure. Um, so uh, just your last comments, I think, are, are really um, something I've been thinking about a lot, too. Um, when I look at interviews with, for instance, transgender people, mm -hmm. and there's like so much just sort of basic self-explanation but also disclosure right. and so many like invasive questions that transgender people get asked. Um, and so I'm curious if you feel like there's um, a sense of solidarity when you read other, you know, like disclosure is a major theme in queer studies as well. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so I'm, I'm curious what, what fields you've sort of drawn from in this critique and resistance to disclosure. Um, I would say what's fascinating to me lately is fat activism. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been reading a lot of um, body politics bloggers and what um, I wrote a piece, I wrote a blog over the summer, I guess. Uh, there was a, there's a blogger called Your Fat Friend, and she talks about how people pretend they're concerned about your weight, their, you know, your weight when they come and talk to you and say, you know, honey, I'm really concerned about you. But in a lot of ways, it's, it's um, just their ploy for giving you all kinds of advice that you didn't ask for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it's not to say, and, and you know, again, when we talk about like fat studies, it's not to say that anyone is advocating an unhealthy lifestyle. It's just that, um, when we think about, is it really your right to come up to someone and say, hey, look how fat you are, therefore I'm going to give you all this advice, because of some visual detail that you can perceive about them. Uh, whereas if they had a drinking problem or something, or they beat their wife, you don't know that. You can't see that on their face. You know, it's not Victorian England, right? No physiognomy going on. Um, so, <laughs> um, and, and so as a, as a blind person, I, I kind of push back against that. Um, that whole that visual privilege that enables someone to say I, I'm concerned about you mm -hmm. um, and one of the posts that I wrote um, mm -hmm. she talked about it as concern and as people kind of trying to diagnose why she is fat and saying you know oh well, honey your father must have left you or mm -hmm. you know there's no reason for you to treat your body this way all this stuff and you, doesn't she want to be skinny right mm -hmm. that's kind of the underlying thing um, and I feel that same uh, solidarity because people often assume don't you want to be cited mm -hmm. don't you want to be cured mm -hmm. um, and many, many, many of the uh, fundraising organizations, philanthropic organizations that are there to help us deal with our disabilities are based on cure rhetoric. Um, I, I went to an event one time and I was a speaker um, and 
I got up and did, uh, it was totally off the cuff because they didn't actually tell me what I was going to speak about. They were like, well, you'll just figure it out. That's mm -hmm. great. Uh, which is fine. I didn't mind that at all. Um, but they, so I did Q&A. I said, what are the questions you've always wanted to ask a blind person? You know, thinking I would get some really cool questions. I didn't. Um, I got, you know, how do you put your makeup on and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, come on, you know, or what are your dreams like? Um, but the girl that got up after me to speak, she said, and it was, and it was an event for, um, you know, trying to raise money for um, vision awareness and, and other, it was a charity event. Uh, but she said, you know, our blindfolds never come off. Um, and, and, and she just totally, and I felt... There's not a word, I guess outed is the wrong term, but like she outed me in this weird fear-based rhetoric that like I was suddenly part of her team in the, you know, let's scare the crap out of all these people and talk about how tragic our lives are. And I didn't, that's not how I operate at all. Mm -hmm. And I felt really implicated and grossed out about never speaking with her again. Um, because it was just, it was not how I saw myself at all. And so I do feel um, that people... People make the same kind of claims that they probably make about transgender people is that, like, you know, oh, oh, she must be trying to look like a woman, or mm -hmm. oh, she must be in the middle of something. I, I had a woman come up to me at the symphony one time, and um, she was really intrusive, and, and, and she said, so has your vision gotten much worse? And I said, what? And she goes, well, before you were just using a white cane. You weren't using a dog. And, and that's just so you could tell people that you were blind. I said, no, I, I use the cane for the same reason that I use the dog. It's not a la it's not an up or down move, <laughs> you know. Mm. Um, usually when you get a dog, it's because you want a dog. It's not because I'm so much more pathetic now that I need, <laughs> need the dog, you know. <laughs> um, but it was really weird how she had all these assumptions about me that, that she had no problem sharing with me. Um, but, but that's the, the danger of being the publicly disabled person who is standing by herself at any given event. Uh, you never leave your disabled friend by themselves because other people will come out and ask them really weird questions. Mm -hmm. That's just the rule. I mean, you always hold their hand, like you know, be their handler, uh, because people will ask you the weirdest questions. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, um, a lot of solidarity with uh, transgender, and then a lot of, and, and it's interesting for me because um, when I meet transgender people, and of course, you know, they have to tell me because a lot of gender is visual. Mm -hmm. And so I can't make any kind of assumptions about what someone's gender is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when people say, oh, I had no idea that was a girl, I'm thinking, what's the big deal? Like maybe I heard their voice and I, I make a lot of assumptions based on what I hear. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say that I'm some sort of superhero for not judging people physically, because I do. I do. You know, I can be shallow just like anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, but, but again, a lot of you know, the way that someone walks or the way that they carry themselves or the clothes that they wear, a lot of those are visual signals of gender. And so. Mm -hmm. um, people make a ton of assumptions and, and they feel entitled to those assumptions. Like, well, I can't believe that's a girl because, you know, can you, you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. do you have the right to, to make any of those assumptions at all? Mm -hmm. And in terms of the, the dog phones, do you mm -hmm. feel like um, animal studies is a, is a field that you're interested in? Because yes, I, I mean, I think absolutely. there is a lot of poetry that is about sort of trying to understand yes. the non-human. So, yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, and what I like to do in my poems is I, you know, of course anybody can write a cute poem about their dog. Um, what I, what I struggle to tell people, and, and most dog lovers have no problem believing this at all, is that he's, he's got his own personality, you know, um, and that the working dog relationship is really unusual because, yes, he does go to work, and, and yes, he has to um, work with me and kind of ignore, you know, the cats that he wants to chase, but, but it doesn't mean that he's my slave, you know, <laughs> um, and a lot of people do like to say that, um, you know, oh, he's just your slave and he never gets to play, and I say, no, of course he gets to play. It's a very fluid relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and the interesting thing, too, is that people talk to me more now that I have the dog. And so I, I have an essay that I wrote um, over the summer <coughs> for The Hopper, which is an uh, ecologically themed magazine out of Vermont. Um, and it's, it's about how traveling with York, who is my dog, um, about how traveling with him has woken me up to the fact that I think we're starved for animal companionship. Mm -hmm. I think that the reason that so many people want to talk to me about him and want to talk to me about their dogs is we live in a really sterile and exclusively human space. Mm -hmm. I mean, look around. You know, he's the only dog in the room. Um, and even in places where dogs are welcomed, they're, you know, they, they're pets. Um, and that's fine. I, I, I do think that dogs should be allowed everywhere as long as they're good citizens. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and, they're, you know, and they behave well. Um, because I, I'm not someone who says, you know, oh, don't bring your dog. I mean, if your dog isn't going to bark and yell at me, that's fine. Bring your dog. But um, I was thinking about it the other day because I, I, I love birds and I love birding. And so I've been trying to identify more birds by ear. And I stopped to listen to some birds um, on the way to class. And then it occurred to me that the space wasn't built for me to stop and do that. And I thought, wow, how weird. Like, yeah, this is the kind of stuff that becomes a poem, right? You just see some random person stopping on the side of the road, and you're like, oh, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're a poet. Um, because you stop, you know, you, you go, oh, that could be a poem. And then you have to stop.
stop and kind of flush her thoughts out. But I thought, everybody's rushing past me, and there's not a little alcove I could step into, like a little birding niche, you know, that would be really cool, um, where you could stop and appreciate what that bird might be. Like, you've got to keep going. So, I mean, that sounds like stopping to smell the roses, but really, our spaces aren't built for us to stop and engage with the more than human world like that. Any other thoughts or questions for Emily? I imagine that dealing with editors who are, who are cited is similar to dealing with students who are cited. <laughs> Would you like to talk about that? It's, it's a challenge. Um, and I will say the most problematic editor I ever had was, you know, I had no idea of knowing whether he was a blind editor or a cited editor. Um, <laughs> it brings up the whole idea of what's the agenda of the publication you're, you're writing for. So um, I uh, was looking for some opportunities for blind writers, and I found a particular website, and I won't, I won't out them. They're outed in an essay that I, <laughs> I wrote. Uh, but they were collecting stories by blind writers, and they said, we'll pay you $100 an essay, which is pretty good. Uh, it's, you know, it's pretty good. So I thought, well, I'm going to write something or see if I have something I can use. And I wrote to the guy and asked for advice, and I said, hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking about. Is this what you're interested in? And he said, yeah, our goal is to provide you know, a diverse picture of blindness but make sure that your essay uses lots of vivid details and that you don't foreground the blindness. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, we don't want it to be all about your diagnosis. We don't want it to be all about the medical aspect. We want it to be about you living your life. And I, my hackles went up. I should, have, I should have sensed it then and there, but I didn't. I thought, I'll press on. You know, I'll convert this guy toward my thinking about disability, which is kind of tyrannical. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, I said, OK. So I prepared a piece, and he really liked it. Um, but I was immediately irked by the fact that he reminded me to use vivid details because I, I had told him my credentials and I thought surely he knew not to have to say that. Um, and then um, after a little bit more dialogue with this editor, it turned out that they didn't want us to use certain words about blindness in their work. Um, they wanted the word sight loss instead of blindness. They wanted the word visually impaired instead of blind. Um, and I did a little more digging on the website and it turns out that uh, the website was primarily for a sighted audience to help them understand that blindness isn't so scary and we're just like you. And, um, and you're thinking, wait a second, that sounds a little bit like what you were trying to do with that other poem. You know, are, aren't blind characters just like non-blind characters? But there's a difference in the slant that is taken. Um, the problem when a sighted person says, you're just like me, now maybe they maybe we do have similarities, uh, but but there is a tendency toward erasure. And so what was happening in this particular publication after I analyzed their submission guidelines and had chatted with their editor, was that we had to kind of make blindness safe so that nobody would feel threatened by it. So they didn't want the essays about the heartbreaking moment when you realize that your vision is leaving you. You know, um, they didn't want the essays about the disappointments that you've encountered. They didn't want the essays about professional struggles that you've dealt with, and. I understand that they didn't want whining, um, but to imply that we were going to whine is kind of, kind of insulting. Uh, that's like another call for poets that I encountered, which said, um, "Looking for work by disabled poets." And we said, "Oh, what you know? What kind of work are you looking for?" And she said, "I don't want your microaggressions. I want good poetry." <laughs> and I saved that line and I used it in an essay. Um, so <laughs> yeah. I thought, "Oh my God!" Um, because again, that's an opposition, right? Implying that. Our microaggressions could not make good poetry, um, also kind of implying that we should censor ourselves and not worry about those little things, when all of us know that the little day-to-day -day irritations are what sometimes reveal something much bigger about the world that we live in, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I, I get it. I mean, I get that they don't want the, liter the, the literature that just is someone describing a diagnosis, but maybe there is some value in that. I mean, if I insist that my story of disability is important, then how can I say, well, my story is so awesome, but I don't want you telling X, Y, and Z kinds of stories? I mean, that's not fair. Um, and they may be the stories that irritate me, but um, they, they kind of need to be out there. So uh, the work that I've had to do as a, you know author talking to editors is making sure that I really understand what their publication is trying to do. And I would say that in those cases, it's the editor who's the authority, whereas with my students, um, that disclosure is a little bit different uh, in the sense that I walk in, uh, before they used to see the white cane and the dark glasses, and then if I put those things away, it's like they didn't have a blind professor anymore. So it would really freak kids out when they would come in on day two and they hadn't seen me on day one. 
you know, and, and I'm already up on the board writing and stuff, and they're like, what? Like, you know, um, but now that I've got the dog, it's kind of harder to hide. So um, I put it out there on the table, and I say, hey, I'm your blind instructor. Here's what you're going to need to do in this class. And for most of them, it's no big deal. In fact, um, I was reading my Rate My Professor things because I'm that person. <laughs> and I do, and I do read them. But I'm interested in, a friend and I were interested in how often the word blind actually came up. And out of like 15 reviews, um, it came up maybe three times. And so it was interesting how we were thinking about what a cool study it would be to look at disabled faculty who are physically disabled, visibly disabled, and see how often that's invoked in their evaluations. And, and why or why not is it invoked? Like, um, one of them said, you know, she's a blind professor, but she's a really good lecturer. Again, not, again, not a contradiction. <laughs> um, another one said, she has a guide dog, but she's not blind. Which meant, you know, I have some vision, um, but guide dogs are only given to blind people. So, you know, again, a little bit, a little, uh, maybe I need to work on logic in my classes. Um, and then uh, the other one said something like, let me just tell you, she's blind. And then it went on to, you know, do the rest of the review. So there was no review that said, you know, she's the worst blind professor I've ever seen, you know. So um, it, it is interesting how it's not as big of a deal to students as you think it would be. I mean, you go in there thinking that they're going to treat you like all the adults in your life have treated you. Um, and then they don't. They're like, okay, cool. How are you going to grade our stuff? I mean, that's, that's really it. Um, I have had one student who, uh, uh, he was, like, he thought it would be appropriate to make blindness-related jokes in my class. Um, he would say things like, oh, hey, guys, maybe if we just don't say anything, she won't know we're here. Which I'm like, well, good luck with that, because I just heard you say that. Um, <laughs> uh, and then one time he was like, um, and one day I had really had enough. I try to be professional in class, but sometimes it slips out. I'm sure you guys can all relate to this. Um, he said, you know, oh, well, we should really submit our work in Braille. That would be hilarious. And I said, why would that be hilarious? Do you know Braille? Mm -hmm. and he said, no. And I said, well, then you're much more likely to make uh, more spelling errors in Braille than you do in print. <laughs> so uh, that kind of, you know, shut it down. What was interesting for me, though, and I, and I know with that particular student, he actually took another class with me and was amazing. So I think he was having his own kind of tough semester. Um, the class did not follow him at all. Like, uh, you know, you, you have these nightmares, right, about all your students all of a sudden turning on you and ganging up on you. And um, they all looked at him like he was crazy. And I don't think it was like, a, ooh, don't talk about her because she's pitiable and sad. It wasn't like that, like, oh, you can't say that to her. It was like, what's your deal? I mean, they nobody laughed. Everyone was kind of like, what's his problem? Oh, man, that's really cool. <laughs> you know, <laughs> They didn't go with him. They weren't. They didn't jump on board. What he was doing seemed ridiculous and out of place to them. So that was a really neat moment for me. Um, but that was a tough situation. I don't know if that really answers your, your question. Oh, no, that's uh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So I will say um, I, I wrote a piece um, called, uh, I called it Stylish Negotiation. And it was all about um, several journals that were overtly seeking work by disabled writers, and uh, specifically blind writers in most cases. And I compared the language of their submission guidelines to talk about what they were really looking for. And um, if I thought about it, I would have printed it off and read some of it for you. But it's, um, it's interesting to see how often they want you to talk about your life as a person. Don't talk about your disability. Talk about your life as a person. And again, it's kind of that like microaggressions versus good poetry thing. Um, my disability should not be in opposition to my life as a person, right? And if I talk about my disability, am I not sharing an experience of my life as a person? You know, um, it's, it's fascinating to me how people set up those. And of course, I love grammar. And so I look into like the grammar of their sentences. And I just love the idea that they set up these oppositions. And then it invariably, um, attracts the writers that fall right into that. They're like, oh yeah, I need to talk about myself as a you know, person first, and I can't talk about my disability at all. It's always got to be this th thing that I minimize. So um, I have been really, really picky about the work that I submit to play. I, I don't submit to places like that at all anymore um, because I don't want them to mishandle my story. Um, probably the, the one place that I was a little iffy about was a journal called uh, Narrative Inquiry and Bioethics, and they're published by Johns Hopkins University. But their um, journal title was, the, the issue theme was living with the label disability. And so this is a journal that normally you know, advocates kind of a narrative medicine model. Um, but that issue itself lent itself to talking about what it meant to be, to call yourself disabled, to be disabled. Um, and in that essay, I explored the idea that a lot of times I show up 
to events where I'm teaching blind people or talking to blind people, and they don't expect me to be a blind person. Um, I worked at a summer camp for blind teens, and I would walk around, and I, I used a cane back then. So you can, if you're a blind person, your ears are really tuned to this, but you can hear a cane kind of going shh along the floor or tapping around. And um, and then when you, you know, I would sit down and I'd fold the cane up, and um, I would hear the, it's, it's so hard to explain because I'm like, I hear this in my head right now. Um, clicks, like click, 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 as you fold the cane up, snap the bungee cord around it, and then you put it next to you. And if, you're, if you've been hearing that sound your whole life, you're like, oh, it's a blind person, cool. Um, but I remember sitting down next to a guy, I was sitting to help him edit his, you know, resume or something. And he was like, you use a cane? Because he heard me fold it up and set it beside me. He said, yeah, duh. He goes, I didn't know you were blind. And so it was funny to me that he didn't expect me to be. Like, it was a surprise that his teacher was blind. I thought, man, so much of our ableism, so much of our expectations is, is not just like those sighted people telling us we can't be anything, right? Um, a lot of times it's in our communities. Because I was the only blind person working at that program, and I also not, didn't get hired back the next year. Um, so, you know, probably because I had a problem with the fact that they would not braille the students' name tags. Um, but... Uh, Again, a lot of those expectations really translate themselves into the communities of disabled people to where they don't expect. I, I have um, a couple of blind students this semester, and they were very surprised to find that I was their professor. So, I mean, I never had a blind professor. Um, or maybe I would have been just as surprised to see somebody walk in with a cane or a dog. I'm thinking about this, though, the uh, Johns Hopkins Journal, mm -hmm. the Bioethics Journal, and mm -hmm. they're asking for you know, people's uh, life stories rather than focusing on their disability. It goes that uh, that concept that Adam Coyson has about um, aesthetic nervousness, mm -hmm. the immediate mm -hmm. anxiety that's generated usually in um, the onlooker about dealing with disability. Right. And so that puts the person with a disability in the position of, well, what foot do I stand on? Do I talk about myself as being disabled, or do I try to minimize right. the disability to I so I relieve their anxiety? Yeah. And it seems like this is always the unspoken. A, a contextual question that a disabled person has is, well, how do I present my disability to other people? Can I speak about it freely, or do I try to sure. become, is it, am I a person first, or am I, or I, or I a disabled person, you know? Well, and it, it even comes out in our bio, so it comes out in mine. Um, on all of my social media, it says, you know, and Lake Michael is a blind poet, musician, and writing instructor. And part of me thought, well, maybe I don't need to say blind, right? You know, they know, right? Um, and then I thought, if I don't say it, they'll think that I left it out because I'm ashamed of it or something. Like, why would I not say it? Well, maybe it's not necessary. And then I thought, by putting the word blind there, am I doing something with that word? Is it doing something? And I still, the problem is, to me, it feels unnecessary because it's the word I've carried around for most of my life. Um, it's the word I've carried around for all of my writing life. But... So, like, I'm used to it, you know? It's like, the it's like becoming invisible well, at this point. Well, it's part of your identity. Yeah, point. it's well, like, well, no big deal, whatever. But I'm then doing. you have people who don't want to deal with your identity or become anxious about your identity. So then I need to put it respond. out there. And then I think, well, what if other blind writers are looking for blind writers? They need to see blind poet. So it is really challenging because you'll have gotten used to some part of yourself that doesn't feel novel anymore. And you'll forget that that novelty can actually be a kind of activism. And so you just continue to put it out there. And I know, I mean, I had family and friends who say, do you really need to say blind? And I go, I guess I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had a really interesting situation. That, again, this made it into an essay. All, all my good stories are in my work. <laughs> that, that's, what is that thing in Dorian Gray where he's like, you know, the, the good poet is the boring person, right? Because, you know, your art um, takes all of your good stuff. But um, in another essay that I wrote, um, I talked about a conversation I had with, with a friend uh, I was, I was interested in a, in a blind guy, uh, and he was like you know, super cute and funny and loved history and all this stuff, and I was telling a friend about it, and she said, well, is he, is he totally blind, or does he have some vision? And I said, oh, he's totally blind, he has prosthetics, prosthetic eyes, which is, again, no big deal to me, I'm used to that, that's something uh, that I've encountered before, and she goes, oh, does that bother you? And I looked at her, and I was like, what? Does it bother you that he's blind? And I thought, wow, she doesn't see me as a blind person anymore. Like, she's erased my blindness, or it's so, she's so comfortable with me that it's not even there. And it was wild, because I thought, why would you say that? That's like saying, you know, if you have a Jewish friend, and they, you know, oh, does it bother you that she's dating a Jewish person? Like, you know, like something, you know, like some random identity, right? You know, uh, you're talking to your female friend, and you say, oh, does it bother you that, you know, your professor's a woman? Like, you know, to, to echo their identity in someone else, wow, like, the fact that I had become so safe for her that it wasn't an issue anymore. And it's like, so, so that's why it spun off an entire essay because I thought, man, I've got to explore that. Um, 
Because there was, the, the other challenge too is, and I think this is unique to disability, um, as opposed to other identity groups, and, and Chris, you might disagree. I don't think there's overt malice. Um, a lot of times when people say things that are, end up being really offensive or really rude or really callous, they're, they're not talking from a place of hate. They think they're saying the right thing. Whereas like with sexism and with homophobia, people are saying things to be hateful. You know what I mean? Like usually they're saying pretty hateful stuff. And with disability, I have a good friend um, who is mixed race, and we talk about this a lot, that, that you know, race issues um, bring out a lot of violence. And, and there is violence in disability communities, but the average ableist comment that you're going to hear on the street is not going to be a hateful one. It's going to be a comment kind of bred out of maybe ignorance or um, just a, oh, I've never encountered that before. And you think, well, the reason you've never... Like, I, I had a... Um, uh, I took an online class one time, and I and I spoke with the professor, and she said, "Wow, blind people are really rare in academia. I admire you." And I said, "I um, I didn't really know how to respond, but I thought that's they're rare because of the, the barriers that are there, not because they're not capable. You know, um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's acceptable for me to say, well, all those other blind people suck, but I'm really something special. I mean, you know, like that's <laughs> not you don't get to do. And I know people who do that, like." Um, there, there was, was an advertisement one time for a blind chef who was teaching cooking classes, and she said, you know, um, you know, her name or whatever, like Sally. She said, you know, Sally doesn't let blindness get in the way of deliciousness. And, like, implying that the rest of us do. You know, like, oh, I can't eat that because, you know, I'm so blind, it won't be any good. You know, like, like, what? Like, and I just have a real problem with the idea that, like, you get to be the one among your tortured masses who it has really made something special out of your life. You know? Well, the deliciousness is a sign of uh, the uh, overcoming narrative. Yes, yeah, absolutely. She overcame her blindness to become a great cook. Right, right. Other blind people. You know? But I do disagree about the violence, because there is a lot of violence against the disabled community. Yes. yes. And this, is, this, this can be statistically verified. And I have a feeling in the coming years, with the election of Trump, we're going to be seeing more violence of that type. So a lot of that sort of thing has been hidden up till now. I think, I think that's what I'm, I'm hinting at, is that it's, it's not as overt. Um, well, I agree with you that there's often the, the awkward moment is caused by people not knowing what to say. Mm -hmm. It's not really coming from a place of malice. But I do think there is a lot of malice out there. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there's another interesting thread in addition to the people that might engage with malice. Um, something that I've encountered when teaching about disability or other um, marginalized groups like um, I'm, I'm thinking in particular of a narrative that I taught in a prison about the Holocaust like mm -hmm. years ago. Um, the students all hated it because the narrative was really resistant of sympathy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the woman was just like annoyed with people who felt bad for her that she was a survivor. And they were like, you know, wh what's the big deal? Isn't it good that I feel sympathy? And, and the students were so uncomfortable yeah. um, with the idea that like, Sympathy can't always be their go-to emotion, and mm -hmm. I think that like some mm -hmm. of, like Emily, you, you use words like, um, uh, obviously in the negative, but like pitiable and pathetic, yeah. and there I think that for people who are well-meaning but not well-versed mm -hmm. in um, thinking about disability studies or knowing people with disabilities, they they think that like, they imagine this sort of bipolar reaction where it's either like disdain, um, which is bad or sympathy, mm -hmm. which is good, and there's no, like, full right. spectrum of human right. emotions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and since, I, Emily, you had, like, some offhand comments about, like, the way people treat you, um, like, as being pitiable, or, mm -hmm. like, the way you resist it, and um, you mentioned that your poems um, are, are in themselves activism against that um, desire to... Um, place into like a I just feel sympathy mm -hmm. um, box and like step into a mood instead. But I wonder if you want to say anything more about um, like the resistance to sympathy and why it's important to, um, you know, not let that be the go to reaction. Sure, absolutely. Um, I think that sympathy is, is, I think that empathy is good. Um, if you can really, you know, I, I'm sure that if I met a Holocaust survivor, I'd be a little bit horrified too because you, but how can you not when you know what? everyone has, they've, they've been through, you know? But then you think, 
Um, I'm sure somebody doesn't want to be defined by one aspect of their life. Mm -hmm. and, and what and, and that's and is that's in the past. Mm -hmm. This is in the now. And how can I relate to them in the now? Um, but I had a woman come up to me. A lot of my interactions happened at the symphony. Um, I had a woman come up to me at the symphony who said, you know, she was asking me about my dog, and um, and she said, uh, you know, oh well, I'm sorry that you need the dog, but. I'm so glad that you could finally find someone to love you. Oh my God! <laughs> and was, okay. Um, and then she walked away, and I didn't want to chase her down and you know, throw things. Six a dog on her. I know, right? <laughs> and so what's fascinating to me, and, and, and I'm kind of working on this. There's a piece. Um, there's an anthology called Writing About Animals, and, and it's looking for essays that teach people how to write about animals. And so I'm working on a piece that uh, for it, and. Um, what I want to talk about is the idea that like my dog is not a superhero for loving me. That that's that's what dogs do, <laughs> um, and that you know um, I'm not some just you know it's a it's a mutual relationship, right? That if he did not love me, he would not work so hard, and he loves me because he trusts me. And I mean, you know, I'm not an animal behaviorist, so I, you know I don't know all the ins and outs of animal trust, but I do know that it, it is reciprocal, and that there's also no way to force a dog to do the work that they do. They have to do it out of love and loyalty. And, um, and see, and when I met my dog at first, he did not like me, so I had to make him love me, you know? <laughs> um, so, but, but it is interesting to me that sympathy, um, the other thing that I find about sympathy is that you can't do much with it. Uh, there yeah. is a poem, let me see if I can find it, um, it's, it's the one that I used to title my manuscript, uh, Natural Compliance, and I think it might show you what I'm talking about. Um, it's like, what do you do with someone's feelings? Because all they say is, I feel bad for you, and then... That's not really like, how can we work that into a solution? You know what I mean? Like, um, how can we make that translate to maybe making a better life? And I do feel that um, when someone expresses sympathy, that's it. You know? Aww. Okay, bye. Like, you know, that's, that's it. Well, you know, it is also the sympathy is not going the next extra step, exactly. which is to put, yeah. put themselves actually in your shoes, which is you've heard this before many times. Yes. And it's not new and it's not particularly edifying. Right. Right. So um, this is a poem I wrote, um, and, and I'll read it and then I'll kind of talk about it. But uh, this one is called Natural Compliance, and it, I think it will illustrate kind of a situation that I haven't found a good solution for, um, but for which I don't really want sympathy. So let's see. So Natural Compliance. The ramp ends here. It's a nice ramp, wide and well-made, room for us to walk side by side, an even surface with sturdy wooden boards. I can trail my hand along each squared top, no splinters, while the draping fronds, waxy and shushing, sweep readily out of my way. But well-spaced wooden boards abdicate to spongy earth, unpredictable roots, pockets of soft sand, no match for the white cane I'm carrying. Feet half forward on the edge, I have options. I can place my free hand on the rail or on the worn narrow padding of your wheelchair's armrest, a choice exacerbated by the green breath ahead. So I wrote that because a, a good friend of mine who um, is now dead, um, uh, I, and I say that because that's about to lead to another funny story, uh, not about death, uh, but uh, she, she and I used to kind of walk the nature trails at UNF, kind of, mean the operative word, um, because she used a wheelchair and I used a white cane, and guess what, the trails are not really what I would call wheelchair accessible. Um, and so we can only go so far before we had to kind of stop. And I thought, and I used to stand there and think, okay, can I go forward on my own? Because I don't really know the trails very well and the signs aren't brailed, I don't think, and I really don't want to get lost. It's easy to get lost there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. see, yeah. so. Right? <laughs> you know, it means like a snake or a bear to eat me. I don't know, I don't have any of those skills. Um, and so I would kind of think, okay, and then she, she would say, you know, um, well, if you want to go sit at a picnic table, I'll go sit with you and we can kind of enjoy um, being outside. But she couldn't come with me. Um, but I really couldn't go forward by myself. And then I kind of have always thinking about this, how do we make the, you know, ecological accessibility is such a privilege of the able-bodied. Um, mm -hmm. And so what do I, you know, what do I do about that? And so um, it kind of, you know, the idea of natural compliance. Is there a compliance that we could, you know, tap into that would allow more people to access nature? Um, but I would say that I wrote that poem not asking for sympathy. Like, oh, how sad, they can't walk in nature together. Like, no. Mm -hmm. um, it's a situation that's troubling for me, but um, I'm still looking for a solution. I do feel like the sympathy that people want to hand you so readily is just a, it's just like a cookie. Like, oh, here, have a cookie, and then, you know, mm -hmm. bye. Um, 
and and the other thing mm. that's funny is, uh, you know, um, you know, when I tell stories about this friend, and they, people say, "Well, well, you know," um, they they would see us working together a lot. We used to go shopping together, and um, you know, we would kind of uh, compliment one another, and that really surprised people because, um, sorry, that's my class alarm, uh, but. That really surprised people because they would see two disabilities and assume that disability was compounded. You know that we were just exponentially helpless, and and we weren't. Um, we managed to work it out, and so it, why why should that be extraordinary that we managed to work it out as two disabled women who have different disabilities? Mm -hmm. um, isn't that what we all do all the time? <laughs> you know, so uh, it is it is really something to think about. Um, again, how, what do you want people to feel when they interact with you? And I think I. And sympathy does feel dismissive in a lot of ways. Any other comments or questions for Emily? Well, I have to say, I mean, I'm not disabled, but I get the whole sympathy thing all the time. Mm -hmm. Whenever I hear people like, oh, so you're trans? You're so brave. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, instead of telling me I'm brave, how come, how come why don't you just vote against Mike Pence and, you know, and Donald Trump and not want me to use a men's bathroom? Yeah, you know, then I would need to be brave. Now, not brave. But because of you, I need to be brave. What the fuck is wrong with you? Right? There's not actually an action being taken. It's just that, oh, it's like, I, I get the feeling that it's sort of like a, a sort of zoo-like experience. Like, here's someone who's different. Let's put them in this box. There's a quote I pulled. Um, I gave my students this essay today by Cameron Hurley, who is a, she's a sci-fi writer, um, and she just published a book over the summer called The Geek Feminist Revolution, which I loved. Um, it was amazing. I sat there and read it, like, cover to cover. Um, and I haven't actually read any of Hurley's sci-fi, so if, you know, if you've read it and you don't like her, whatever, you know, sorry. I haven't read I've only read her nonfiction. I love when fantasy writers write nonfiction. So, um, but her essay is about how the, the hero archetype is essentially male and what people can do to uh, work against that. And the idea that, you know, we're not all a bunch of hostile, sexist people for, for thinking of a man when we hear hero. That's because of the stories that we've been told. And can we find a way to talk back to that? So um, this is the very tail end of her essay. And I really liked this quote. So uh, she says, I like to challenge the expectations of story. I like to challenge the way I was taught language. I like to tear it down and remake it because I see so often that what I was served up on a plate was so often in service to someone else's narrative. In someone else's wish for the world, how the world would be. A world that did not include me or people like me. A world that pretended we never existed at all. That's not my world. And that's not the world I write about. And so when I read that, I was like, that's what I do, Cameron Hurley? Like, I got really excited. Um, because it is. I mean, and it's not, and, and again, as, a, as, an, as an artist, um, Virginia Woolf talks about this in uh, Women in Fiction, right? She says, look, um, I love Charlotte Bronte, but she's kind of preachy. You know, <laughs> like, uh, nobody wants to read somebody's diatribe. Nobody wants to read um, somebody's sermon on the rights of women. They want to see a world where women are able to do what they want. Mm -hmm. And so when you make a poem, and the poem is like a world, I want to make a poem where I'm able to do and live the kind of life that I want. And, and it's not about being, uh, and again, I, strident is a problematic word because of all its associations with like feminism but, um, and you know, female stereotyping. But I'm not saying that like you should soften your approach at all. It's not about, it, I guess it's more against the extrovert bias of our culture. that that we expect our protests to be loud and in your face and, and to have a certain volume. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe negotiate or protest in the way that an introvert would, which is what are you going to do with the silence? But also provide an, a different alternative. I think a lot about, again, that whole natural compliance. Is there a, is there a path that I haven't yet opened up that would work? You know? and, re and I think sometimes the reason that people go to sympathy is because that's all they've been taught. You know, that's all they've been taught to feel. So what can you build for them so that they can feel something new? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.